Good morning, all, and thank you for joining the Higher Ground Developing Affordable Housing and Community Facilities in Partnership with Faith Communities webinar, which has been generously sponsored by our funder, City National Bank. My name is Megan Shannon Vlkovic, and I'm the market leader for Enterprise Community Partners Southeast. For those of you who are not familiar with Enterprise Community Partners, we are a national nonprofit housing intermediary bringing capital policy and solutions to markets across the country, supporting community development and affordable housing. As many of you are aware, the demand for affordable housing options is greater than what is available to our families and our communities. Over the last 15 plus years, median income has risen by 19% while rents jumped by 85% in Atlanta. We lose 1500 affordable units annually to the market and statistics show that 72,000 Atlanta households need an affordable home now with 9,700 more expecting to be needed by 2027. We are facing a housing affordability crisis and we believe houses of worship across the region can be a part of the solution. Our initial research reveals there are hundreds of faith-based owned parcels in Fulton County alone that could include affordable homes and redevelopment strategies, serving our families and individuals, our seniors and our homeless. Today, we are hoping to launch a series of webinars providing information, lessons learned and technical assistance on how houses of worship can activate their own real estate to be a part of the solution in affordable housing. Today's agenda will cover lessons learned by our very own Mid-Atlantic market leader, Reverend David Bowers, who leads Enterprise's faith-based development initiative out of the DC office. Then two case studies of faith-based development across the region, led by Timothy Block, our local lead for the Southeast Faith-Based Development Program, today's webinar organizer, and who will also be our moderator for today's session. We will then have a session on the legal perspective regarding faith-based development presented by Althea Broughton, partner at Arnold Golden Gregory. And lastly, we will end with a panel discussion on working as a team, the partner's point of view. As we prepare to spend the next two hours learning and sharing with each other, we are honored to have with us Reverend Dr. John Foster of Big Bethel AME Church, who will provide a welcome and an opening prayer. Reverend. Thank you, Megan, and, and welcome to everyone here today. Uh, my name is John Foster and I'm pastor of Big Bethel AME Church. I'd like to spend a couple moments uh, sharing with you uh, some about Big Bethel and also uh, how we got involved with affordable housing. Uh, Big Bethel AME Church is a predominantly African-American uh, uh, congregation that was founded in 1847. Um, we're right here in historic downtown Atlanta area on Auburn Avenue. Uh, we're on the stretch of uh, Auburn that houses the four main uh, historic uh, civil rights churches of Wheat Street, Big Bethel, Ebenezer, and Butler Street. Is our membership uh, is about 850. And as I mentioned before, uh, predominantly African-American uh, with our congregation. Although our congregation is uh, 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 mostly cons uh, consists of uh, folk from the fourth ward in the area uh, that is adjacent to the church. We have members coming in from all parts of town. So from the north, south, east, and west of, of Metro Atlanta, uh, we are uh, blessed with membership all over. Uh, beginning in the early 1970s, then Big Bethel uh, had the opportunity to become uh, involved intricately with affordable housing. And at that time, we built uh, what was called Bethel Towers uh, through a joint partnership with uh, HUD. Uh, in the 1970s, we were able to build uh, the structure that is there today. Uh, Bethel Towers is 180 units of, of affordable housing. It's a 16-story high-rise. Uh, it uh, consists of, of uh, apartments of various sizes ranging from one to three bedroom apartments. Uh, Bethel Towers has been a mainstay of affordable housing on that stretch of Auburn Avenue uh, for all these years. Uh, however, uh, since the 1970s, uh, the units have grown old and, and the uh, overall infrastructure of the towers 
uh, grew in great need of repair. Uh, so uh, beginning about 2015, 2016, uh, we start negotiating uh, with a developer, uh, the Benoit Group, and, uh, and joining a new partnership between uh, HUD, the Benoit Group, and Big Bethel to do a $30 million renovation of Bethel Towers. Uh, that was a, a total uh, renovation of each one of the 180 units, uh, total renovation of all the utility infrastructure uh, that is there in the, in the towers, the, the electrical, the plumbing, the, uh, um, you know, all the HVAC systems and things of that sort. And uh, over that time, uh, spend $30 million to really give it just a massive facelift. Uh, that renovation is uh, at the completion stage. That is, we went through a period of time where all the tenants had to be moved out and then moved back in. Uh, and we chose to do this project one side of the high rise at a time, so 90 units at a time. And so the last set of of the 90 were moved back in uh, over the summer time frame, the July and August. And so now the new Bethel Towers is, is ready to go through this new chapter of, of our lives. Uh, let me also add that uh, the new Bethel Towers is still 100% affordable housing. Uh, at one point in time, we wrestled with whether or not to go with mixed use housing and things of that sort, but we did stay true to the original uh, purpose of the, of the Bethel Towers housing to have it still remain 100% 100 affordable housing. So Big Bethel has had some experience with uh, this whole issue of affordable housing and, and we are, are very happy to be able to stay true to our mission to offer this in the downtown affordable housing uh, area. Uh, we uh, also offer other things through uh, commercial properties of stores and things of that sort. Uh, but the Bethel Towers project is by far the, uh, the predominant uh, thing that we, that we offer to the neighborhood and to the community in terms of what we do. Uh, so with that being said, then let us uh, now uh, open in a word of prayer. Uh, let us bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you for this faith-based development initiative. We thank you for this session that is gathered here today uh, that we call Higher Ground, that we're uh, able to come together and to, to look at the aspect of affordable housing and community facilities, uh, how we can combine faith-based um, faith communities with, with other partners to do some things that the end result would be that there's more affordable housing and more communities, affordable communities uh, here in the downtown area. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all the stakeholders who have gathered together uh, in this place uh, with the goal that will make living um, a, a little bit easier for those who need that uh, in the city of Atlanta. Uh, Lord, we ask that you bless the presenters, that you bless the part participants, that, Lord, you create linkages, uh, that, Lord, you help mold and build relationships from this uh, two-hour meeting, uh, that, Lord, we may all grow in the knowledge and the understanding of how to, to make affordable housing and communities uh, happen uh, in this place. And we will give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. We lift up in your name we pray. Uh, let the people of God say amen, amen. Thank you, Reverend Foster. Thank you, Megan. Uh, good morning. My name is Timothy Block. I'm a program director on the Southeast team of Enterprise Community Partners. And uh, I too would like to welcome you to our webinar series entitled Feeding Faith Leaders with Community Fervor. Um, today's webinar, uh, we're so happy that you're able to attend. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, the webinar is being recorded, so hopefully you're comfortable with that. Um, everyone, with the exception of the presenters, have been muted upon entry. 
Um, so uh, we will uh, entertain questions from the participants. In order to do that, we're asking that you please use the Q&A feature of Zoom versus the chat feature. Um, Megan and myself will be monitoring the questions and answers and we'll be providing those to particular presenters. We ask that if you do have a question for a specific panelist that you identify that in your question so that we can make sure that that question get, gets routed to the appropriate person. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that we are um, going to be sending out a copy of the recording of this webinar and the slides that the presenters will be sharing with us. Um, and we will have a brief survey that we will ask you to complete as well. Um, so with that, I want to go ahead and kick off the webinar with our first presenter who uh, Megan um, introduced. His name is Reverend David Lowers. He's the VP of our Mid-Atlantic uh, Office for Enterprise Community Partners. And with that, David, I'll turn it over to you. Tim Block, thank you so much. I want to say a word of thanks to my colleague, Tim Block, to my colleague, Megan uh, Shannon, and the entire Southeast uh, Office of Enterprise Community Partners, and uh, kudos to you all for pulling this together. I want to say it's good to have everyone who is attending today's session, and I'm honored to be here and excited to see how things are uh, spreading down to our, uh, uh, our office in the Southeast. So looking forward to conversation today. So I'm sharing my screen and we will jump <clears throat> right into it. So again, David Bowers, I've been in enterprise now for 16 years. I uh, wanted just to remind folks, some may know that I always like to remind folks, enterprise was founded out of a faith-based encounter. The late Jim Rouse was a successful real estate developer. And the story was that as he was part of the Church of the Savior community in Washington, D.C., there were three women who wanted to preserve a couple of buildings as affordable for low income folks in the Adams Morgan neighborhood in DC. And he did what any good developer would do, ran the numbers. And the story comes back that Mr. Rouse said, look, the, the numbers just don't pencil out. This doesn't, doesn't financially make sense. And I always say, never doubt the power of three women in a faith community. So they went off and raised and put down a non-refundable deposit um, and said to Mr. Rouse, now, what are you willing to do? And it literally changed his life. And he thought, what if we combine uh, for-profit business disciplines with that kind of faith and commitment to serve. So I like to remind people and myself included that enterprise was really founded out of a faith-based encounter. And to say to folks that when underwriting said no, faith said yes. And that's an important thing to keep in mind as you may go along in this journey. Um, you've heard about kind of who and what enterprise is and our national stretch. And so glad that you all are connected with our office in the Southeast. Um, some three key pillars that really connects in with our work around the faith-based development initiative around advancing racial equity and upward mobility, increasing housing supply, and building the resilience and well-being of, of places, people, and buildings. And so a lot of this work really does touch multiple uh, of these pillars, if you think about it. So I'm from our Mid-Atlantic office with our footprint covering DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, and a focus on like enterprise nationally, one of our key focus areas is preserving affordable housing and producing new housing. When I came to our market 16 years ago, uh, Washington DC in the metro area is one of the highest cost uh, uh, real estate markets in the country it was then and is now. And so being mindful of kind of what we were trying to do in our areas of focus and the tools that we had on the financing side uh, really did kind of lay the groundwork um, for our faith-based development work. And to that point, so who we are in terms of the faith-based development initiative and lessons that I'll be sharing. So we started out with some strategic advisors and co-collaborators, a local nonprofit, East of the River Clergy Police Community Partnership, Georgetown University, and then later Wesley Seminary. And for the last uh, five, six years, we've been working in collaboration with the University of Baltimore, who's a current partner. So we launched in 06, our goal is very simple. It's to get new units of affordable housing and or community facilities developed. And when we say community facilities, we're essentially saying anything that is not solely a sanctuary space. So it could be neighborhood serving retail, could be a healthcare clinic, could be a educational facility. Um, so we're help trying to get those developed, that in housing. 
And our approach is to work with houses of worship with undeveloped or underdeveloped land and to help them make informed go or no go decisions about development. And we're, our approach is to connect houses of worship to intellectual and financial capital, or as I like to say, dollars and cents with an S to help them along that journey. The why may seem obvious, but want to lift it up. Certainly, we know nationally and in our region and most regions, big regions around the country, uh, one in five, one of every five, 20% uh, of renters are paying more than 50% of their income for their housing expenses. We call this severe cost burden. Uh, in our region, in the D.C. metro area, when we started, nearly 10,000 homeless in the region, and obviously economic and other disparities by ethnicity and geography um, that are not unique to D.C. or Baltimore and our footprint. Surely you all have it um, in your area, and you see it around the country. But there's also potential coupled with that need. Houses of worship own a large amount of real estate. Um, the Urban Institute just last year looked at 800 vacant parcels owned by houses of worship just in four jurisdictions in the Washington, D.C. metro area. And their kind of back of the envelope, if you would, analysis showed that you could build anywhere from 43,000 to 109,000 new units of housing. Just, just think about that for a minute, the potential just on those 800 vacant parcels in four jurisdictions. And, and Megan earlier alluded to some of the analysis that was done even um, in Atlanta in terms of land owned by Houses of Worship. So there is a need Right, there is a need uh, at the gate called beautiful, right? That we, as we go in and out of our worship spaces, oftentimes we are stepping over those who are in need in our midst. But we have a lot of potential with the land that is owned by houses of worship to help meet that need. So what our approach has been is not to make uh, a clergy or lay leadership experts but to make them comfortably conversant about the development process so that they can have informed conversations with developers, with real estate lawyers, with bankers, with government housing officials and the like. So we do trainings on different aspects of the development process, everything from visioning to the nuts and bolts of development, accessing public and private capital, you know, interfacing with public housing official, uh, public officials from housing departments, um, as well as bankers, accounting, asset management. So a range of trainings to get you comfortable with, with the issues. Um, we have provided some capital uh, grants for market studies and feasibility analysis, recoverable early pre-development grants, and of course the access to the full range of enterprise uh, products and services. And we always tell people, you're gonna shop around, you connect with a development partner, and nine out of 10 cases, a house of worship is likely going to partner with uh, a development partner. And that's one of the things you'll see here, one of the bullets, development consultants. We have bullpens of developers and development consultants that we connect houses of worship to. And we don't tell houses of worship who to work with, but we give you access to folks that you can interview who we know can do the job. And you see if you're comfortable and give you a sense of the types of questions you should be asking as you shop around for your experts. Um, also bullpens of legal services. We have collaborations with law firms and some legal clinics. We always say, if you're doing a real estate development deal, please make sure you have a real estate development lawyer and one that represents just the house of worship. And that's a key distinction because if you partner with a developer, they are likely going to have a legal counsel that they use and that's fine. And you'll have a partnership and there's a legal counsel for the partnership. One of the lessons learned has been to ensure that you have a real estate lawyer or a lawyer that is representing um, just the house of worship at some point here. And then there are varying types of technical assistance that we're able to provide organizational development analysis. Many, some houses of worship have a nonprofit associated with it that they want to be part of the development process. Um, and it's oftentimes a paper nonprofit. And what we mean by that is it has, uh, you know, it's, it's Sister Johnson or Deacon Jones who have been volunteering for years to run it, but there's no paid staff, no audited financials. Uh, and so it's really more of a paper organization um, and so if you want an organization that's affiliated with the house to be a partner in a multi-million dollar real estate development deal, oftentimes there's uh, uh, some things that need to be done to strengthen it. So we are able to provide some folks who can give analysis around that. Um, and then some of the project specific TA and, and other types of zoning analysis, again, to help folks make informed go or no go um, decisions. And when we talk about uh, market studies and feasibility studies, 
it's one thing to understand, hey, we have we have land and we have a desire to build, say, senior housing or family rental. One, you need to know if there's a market for that. Is there an actual demand for what you're thinking you want to build? But on top of that, you also want to know how feasible is it? So as you're trying to make a decision, somebody may come in and tell you, oh, you want to build senior housing and you can use tax credits for senior housing. That's great to know. But going further, the feasibility, you want to know how, what's the accessibility of tax credits for senior housing? Do, does your local jurisdiction get a big allocation or is it rare? Is the state funding agency prioritizing senior housing or family housing or whatever it is you may be looking to build? So it's important, important to get that kind of analysis. What we've been able to accomplish over the years, uh, we've helped to bring online over 1,200 units of affordable housing as well as a health clinic with another 1,000 units in the pipeline. You see some of the information on the amount of grants we've been able to provide over a quarter million dollar in grants, a $10,000 market study and feasibility grants. Um, and some other grants have been able to provide loans and tax credit equity. And that's just money that Enterprise alone has put in. Many, of the, Some of the transactions don't even use Enterprise financing. And so they're, we're leveraging other private uh, lenders as well. This is just money that Enterprise has been able to put in. A number of trainings and workshops. And I mentioned our collaboration with the University of Baltimore. We've been doing a faith-based development certificate program uh, where we've graduated uh, 22 houses of worship over the last five years to go through a six-month intensive uh, program uh, and also get development consultants for five hours a month to help them flush out their uh, vision um, as they're looking to, to build. So there's a timeline here that just shows, and this, this slide deck will be provided for folks. You kind of see the trajectory of where we've gone. I won't go over all of the examples. Again, you will get access to the slide deck, but just a couple that I wanted to highlight. This Plaza West development is a very interesting project. Um, because it includes some grandparent housing um, targeted, so some family family units, but also units uh, targeting uh, grandparents raising grandkids, as well as 11 units for permanent supportive housing. Interesting collaboration here. Um, also want to look at East of the River. This project is interesting because it's a nonprofit that was created by a collaboration of Houses of Worship and the police department and others. And you actually had a, a Baptist church that donated some money that helped the nonprofit buy land. Um, and initially, this, these units were used for those who were formerly incarcerated. Now it's targeting those who were formerly um, homeless. So an interesting uh, approach. I also wanted to highlight Roundtree Residences, an example of some senior housing that, that was done by an AME church uh, in Southeast Washington, DC on uh, a kind of parking lot, under, underutilized parking lot land right across from the street, uh, right across from the church, excuse me. This is an interesting project, Israel uh, Manor. So Israel Baptist Church in Washington, DC. This building that you see in this picture was literally built on their parking lot uh, at the bottom of the hill, a, park, a parking lot. So it's a three-story building. First two floors are a health clinic, uh, Unity Healthcare is the anchor tenant, and the top floor is actually a banquet hall and meeting space. Um, so it provides lower cost uh, meeting facilities and amenity for the community, as well as a revenue source um, for the House of Worship and its associated nonprofit. And then about a block away on some land the church acquired, they built the 47 unit of senior housing um, right around a, a metro station, a subway station in Washington, D.C., in a, in a neighborhood that has been uh, uh, highly gentrifying over the last number of years. So a real benefit and asset. Finally, Trinity Plaza, just want to flag this as another mixed use development, 49 units of housing on the top. Uh, on, the on the ground floor, you have a neighborhood, neighborhood locally based pharmacy as well as uh, a daycare actually um, are, are there. So a couple of things to keep in mind, some questions that we encourage houses of worship to contemplate. These are, as you think about engaging in, in a process with our colleagues in, in the Southeast office, in navigating through, there's some key questions you wanna ask as a house of worship. For, do you have site control of the land and do you wanna maintain ownership or site control over the land over the long term? Kind of yes, no, that's a key threshold question. What are your short and long-term economic goals for the house of worship? Do you expect cash flow from the development? Are you willing to subsidize the project over time or you want it to break even? There's no right or wrong answer, but you need to ask this question and know what your long-term, short and long-term financial needs are from a development project. 
Um, so that can help inform your, your conversations and negotiations with your partners. Are you willing to contribute any portion of the land value? If the, if the land is worth a dollar, do you want to get a dollar back for it? Or are you willing to say, look, we'll take 80 cents or 50 cents, or we'll donate the land so that we can, for the mission portion of this project, um, uh, be able to serve perhaps lower income uh, per persons. Again, no right or wrong answer, but you want to be clear on that your land has value. Um, and if you are contributing some portion of that land value, how does that factor into the deal? Uh, what type of housing are you trying to build? What is your targeted market? Do you have any economic empowerment interests or racial equity goals? So for in addition to just building the housing that will serve people in the community, which is great, there are a lot of people who get paid on a real estate development deal from the landscaper to the caterers, to the title company, to the lawyers, the developers. So you want it to the general contractors. Are there some economic development goals that you have as it relates to where money goes in the project. We had one project that actually created a, a, church, a church, created a property management company that so that they could partner with um, the, the, their development partners, property management company over time and, and teach folks the business. Do you expect to have an active role in the development? And if so, do you have a separate entity for, for that development? Do you have a nonprofit that's gonna be involved? Yes or no? Does it have infrastructure? Yes or no? Um, and as you talk to your lawyers, the notion of whether you have a separate entity or not, the notion of a legal firewall sometimes and issues like that that I'm sure will be discussed uh, by our next presenter. Um, do you, is there a development team or a main point of contact in place in the house of worship? Who is the decision maker in the house? Um, and again, do you have a real estate attorney? So key lessons learned. Um, unfamiliarity with the development process or fear of the unknown often will lead houses of worship to take no action at all. Um, so that's why this extensive te technical assistance, again, getting people comfortably conversant to make the go or no go decision is really critical. Um, again, we say sometimes it's not, it, you know, a no decision, um, a, a slow non-decision can be worse than a no go decision, right? So just be intentional. We're not saying every house of worship that owns land ought to do this. But if you know there's a need and you have an asset that could be utilized for that, be intentional in the reflection, the prayer, the, the analysis that, that will get you to an informed go or no-go decision. Timelines, I always say developers work on a quarterly timeline and in the faith community, our frame of reference is eternity. So our sense of urgency can be different. So oftentimes we have to speed up the faith community folk and slow down the developers, help them meet somewhere in the middle in their conversations. Um, at times there's mistrust and a lack of appreciation by both the house of worship and the developers on what the value we add is that the other brings to the table. Understand your worth, know what it is that you're bringing in terms of land, in terms of relationships in the community, um, but also understand if you're partnering with a developer, they have things that they're bringing to the table as well. Issues that have to be, they're varying financial issues, things like guarantees and who gets paid what, when. Um, all sides should be a, a clear upfront, what's in it for me? Clergy leaders cast the vision, gain buy-in from the membership, and delegate day-to-day uh, -day management. Uh, you can delegate authority, but not responsibility. Ultimately, obviously, the buck may stop with you, uh, but oftentimes you want to make sure that things don't get jammed up with you and have others in the house who are helping you. So last couple of slides here, just as we close out. One, um, why to get involved, how's the worship on this land? We know there's need. Um, identify leadership within the house, take advantage of the key partnerships like what you're hearing with Enterprise. And so this is an exciting day to see um, all gathered for this conversation. Uh, houses of worship can pursue building on land, whether you're big or small, we've a uh, connectional or non-connectional. Many are, are uh, land rich and cash poor. We've seen that happen. Uh, projects built on a half acre of land, uh, a couple of parcels or 30, 40, 50, 100 acres of land. Um, and so there are varying ways to approach this. Um, wanted to say in terms very quickly, if there are folks from philanthropy or government on the line, there are examples more and more of how this movement is expanding. Um, capital to support program management and operations and the catalytic early grants that we talked about as well as obviously subsidy capital. There's an example in Alameda County, California, put out a $750,000 RFP a few years ago for program administration of an initiative that looks very much like what we've been doing. The New York Office of the Attorney General uh, put money into, again, 
the operations of a program uh, like this. And so if you're on the line and you're with the foundation or you're with the local government, uh, we've had a local foundation provide us money that has provided much for the $10,000 grants that have been very catalytic for the market study and feasibility analysis. So there are varying ways in which uh, local and state governments and foundations play a role. Uh, we're excited uh, to see that our movement is going uh, national at enterprise and also just taking hold uh, or even beyond enterprise. So again, exciting to see what's happening here in the Southeast office. Um, there's also a resource here. You'll see a white paper that we did earlier this year, leveraging property owned by faith-based organizations. Um, and so there's a link uh, to there uh, on the paper there. And then finally, just say for those who may be interested, this is in, your, in the deck kind of the biblical grounding for doing uh, uh, development, right? When people say, well, why is the house of worship doing this? How is it? And, and uh, is it okay to get government support or not? So the story of Nehemiah is very instructive, very insightful, and has some real tangible lessons on things that you will meet and encounter as you go along the way. So for more information, you obviously know how to get in touch with Tim Block there in Atlanta, and you've got my contact information there. So. I will just say that understand this process is absolutely difficult and challenging and eminently doable. Both things are true. Yes, you will have to pray. It will be challenging, but it happens every day and you can absolutely get it done. So I pray your continued uh, faithfulness in this and your success. So Tim Block, I turn it back to you, sir. Thank you, David. Appreciate you so much for giving us that great overview of the work of the Faith-Based Development Initiative and the things that you're doing in the Mid-Atlantic office. And um, you should get a lot of praise, my brother, for all the hard work you've done to try to lift this throughout the enterprise um, footprint. So really appreciate you. I think that's a great segue into our next panel. But before I, I do that, there was one question that came through, which was um, for Reverend Foster, who I believe had to drop off. So we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm gonna read the question and then we're gonna go back and get the answer to the question and make sure that we make all the questions and answers available to the um, participants after the webinar. So the question was, did Big Bethel form a new legal entity with Benoit and HUD for the 30 million renovation of Bethel Towers? What ownership interest does Big Bethel have in the new entity? And I think we'll touch on some of those things, maybe not particular to Big Bethel, but you know how you should, structure that and how some um, of the case studies that we're gonna um, go over how they did it. So, but we'll get that specific question answered and get it back out to everyone. So with that said, I wanna go ahead and um, move us to our first panel, which is case studies, faith-based development across the region. Um, we have some dynamic presenters to talk about the projects that they've been able to uh, accomplished working together with uh, the faith community and um, with um, other organizations. So I'm not going to read the bios of every presenter because those um, are available in the agenda. Um, it has been updated, so we'll send that out as well so that you'll have everyone's um, current bio. But um, our presenters for this panel include Dennis Richards, who is the Senior Director for National Church Residents and he is going to talk about the True Light Haven project that they did in partnership with True Light Baptist Church. Um, and um, from the church, we have Reverend Dr. Daryl Elligan, um, who is also going to talk about the project as well. And then we'll also hear from um, Philip Searles from the Searles Foundation. He's actually the president. And he's going to speak about the project that they did, which is the Legacy at Vine City. Um, so first up, we'll go ahead and have Dennis and Reverend Elligan tell us about True Light Haven. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning, and thank you to the Enterprise team. Uh, you all are doing very commendable work, and we're glad to be a part of it. I'm pleased to be here today uh, with Reverend Dr. Darrell Elligan, uh, pastor of True Light Baptist Church. He and I will advance through this slide deck for you. Uh, we're here to discuss our True Light Haven partnership um, and very excited about it. Um, for starters, uh, again, my name is Dennis Richards. I'm the Senior Director of Housing Development for National Church Residences. Uh, I've been with our organization for about 12 years now. 
um, in a number of capacities, but currently uh, responsible for all of our development work within the Atlanta MSA and all of the counties therein. Uh, I uh, specifically uh, focus on all of our new construction activity, uh, substantial renovation, and acquisition rehab of uh, senior affordable housing. Um, National Church Residences has been around since 1961. We were originally founded out of a, a Christian mission to provide uh, affordable housing to vulnerable populations. Uh, and we are currently the, the nation's largest provider of uh, uh, affordable housing for seniors, nonprofit affordable provider of uh, housing. Uh, we serve over 30,000 seniors daily across our platform. Uh, we own about 350 properties uh, and we operate in 26 states in Puerto Rico. Uh, we do more than just affordable, however, that is our lifeblood, um, but we also have assisted living uh, facilities, memory care, uh, continuum care retirement communities, and a host, we offer a host of uh, home and community-based services. Um, our vision is to advance better living for all seniors uh, to enable them to remain home for life. Our intent is not just to simply build housing, but we want to keep folks in their home and out of high-cost care settings, such as uh, an emergency room uh, or skilled nursing. Um, we've been doing business in Georgia uh, for over 25 years now. Uh, most of our communities are situated within the Atlanta uh, MSA. We do have a, a, a couple in the Savannah area. Um, currently have uh, 11 properties, just under 1,500 units uh, under operation, and we have two other properties, uh, one in Pembroke, Georgia, under construction, and then one that we're here to discuss today, our True Light Haven Apartments community under construction uh, near Westlake Mart on the west side of uh, Georgia. And I'll hand it to you, Pastor. Good, thank you, Dennis, and good morning to Tim, Enterprise, Faith Leaders, all the participants. My name is Reverend Elligan, Senior Pastor of the True Light Baptist Church, located in Northwest Atlanta. I'm also the Atlanta Regional Chaplain for National Church Residency. And a little bit about the True Light Baptist Church in that we were founded in 1956 and has been at her current location since 1960. We just finished celebrating our 64th church anniversary virtually. I am the third pastor of the church, first having served 28 years, second nine years, and myself 27 years. So there's a sense of stability in leadership. And as well, uh, I was raised in the community and attended high school in the community as well. Our church theme is that we are a church where miracles really happen. We do still believe in miracles. And our mission is to build ministries that will impact the need and encourage the growth of the individual, the family, the church, and the community. So a little bit in terms of our partnership, and I'm gonna talk much more later about the significance of partnership in that what we believe uh, is very, very important. Uh, we, we believe that if you find a need, fill it. If you find a hurt, heal it. And so some of the partnership uh, benefit and outcome that we have and that we bring to the partnership credibility as well as land and so uh, monetize and activate it, uh, vacant land. We build much needed affordable housing uh, for vulnerable seniors in the community, building a new church, the True Light Baptist Church. And in particular, a real highlight is that we create community partnership that will serve the Penelope neighborhood uh, for decades and years to come. So as I talk about partnership and the significance of partnership in that as a church, we build people, but we partner with people who build buildings. And if I could give one word that would uh, and could revitalize and revolutionize our congregation, our community at large, it would be the word partnership. Partnership, uh, as I know it, comes from this African proverb that if you want to go fast, go along. If you want to go fur, fur, go together. So when we talk about partnership, from my perspective, it just makes good sense to, to partner 
And one has to do with uh, leadership and casting the vision. Everybody know that a good leader casts a vision, but it takes good people to carry the vision. So in our case in particular, we had a senior mother of the church that also lived in the community. So when I cast the vision, she actually carried it. So you talk about the power of influence. Uh, leadership sometimes can be a title, but leadership really is influence. She carried the ball. Our vision has to do with four E's, evangelize, educate, edify, but more specifically, embrace the future. So we move forward in terms of understanding as a church within partnership, uh, the need for stewardship. And in these days, churches are closing weekly and participation is uh, declining. Uh, somebody said earlier, churches are land rich and cash poor. But when we consider uh, the dwindling and declining membership, which means dwindling and declining money and resources, good, good stewardship through partnership enables the church to multiply the effectiveness and efficiency of its limited resources by tying them to others. But the major key is having the same values. You wanna partner with people that has the same value, in particular for us, spiritual values, people that care about others. And it ties into the chaplaincy program that I'm gonna talk about shortly, but that was one of the key factors in our partnership that uh, enabled us to work very well with National Church Residency. And I lead the Atlanta Regional in terms of partnership. Then the ultimate uh, step is victory through partnership, which we believe is a win-win uh, a for everybody that is involved. Uh, in terms of our mission, every individual family church in the community, um, per this slide, every citizen, every community, every church, and everybody in the city all uh, become winners as a result of good partnership. And so then when we look at our values and what is significant in terms of doing this partnership, uh, some of the challenges that we face uh, has to do with uh, a lack of people having proper uh, health care. And, and so we look at the determinants of health and wellness. And in particular, you see the slide in terms of physical, emotional, social, and spiritual. So we always have a holistic approach personally as a church. And so we want to match our value with someone that had the same values of physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, and spiritually taking care of, uh, of all people and seniors in particular. So our chaplaincy program is in place I currently have uh, nine volunteer chaplains. We serve uh, 10 of the 11 properties that are in the uh, Atlanta metropolitan area. We serve residents as well as staff. Our church will be a main intricate part of the chaplaincy program and particularly closely connected to uh, True Life Haven. So that is that was the key factor in terms of our partnership this chaplaincy program and the spiritual needs of all people being met because we build people, National Church residents build buildings and they build people as well. So it was an awesome uh, connection. And, and we're very grateful for it. Uh, True Light uh, um, Baptist Church has been the lifeblood of this community, uh, certainly under Reverend Elegant's leadership as well. Um, this here's a aerial of the site. Um, it's just over uh, 5.3 acres. As you can see, it is a transit-oriented uh, site, very close to uh, the Westlake Marta Station. Um, right across the street from it is the uh, Sadie Mays uh, Rehab Center. Um, you know, when we entered upon this uh, particular partnership, um, it was, you know, the church uh, certainly expressed that, you know, they wanted to see two edifices rise off this site. Uh, they wanted to serve the need for seniors in this community, uh, as it was uh, referenced early on in the presentation, there is a significant need for affordable housing in Metro Atlanta. Um, church certainly recognized that, um, and that's, this is our opportunity to, to help them serve. Um, but with that, they also wanted to realize uh, a new church facility. Um, so what we uh, set out to do was get the full site entitled. Uh, we did a, a subdivision of the lot and we planned um, 
are both projects, uh, True Light Haven Apartments there on your left, um, and then the future church of True Light uh, Baptist Church there on your right. Still in the planning stages, early planning stages on the church. Uh, again, the apartment community is under construction. Um, this is what it'll look like. This will be uh, the rear of the building parking tucked into the back. Um, it'll orient on the site uh, like this, uh, 124 units and four stories with two elevators. Um, since we are planning two properties, you know, certain uh, synergies, if you will, are created in that endeavor, uh, one of which is infrastructure. So, uh, if, for instance, our, we are sizing our uh, water retention in a manner so it will help the church uh, when they go uh, to build their property. Uh, so things of that nature are uh, certainly beneficial to uh, both phases of the development. Um, We'll have a number of amenities in the building. Uh, we'll have a multi-purpose room, laundry room, business center, covered porch, fitness room. Uh, it'll be a community uh, uh, room with a warming kitchen. And we will we'll program with the church in these spaces, uh, bring services into the building, and the uh, uh, church will be a vital part of that. As Pastor referenced, uh, the church is certainly um, leading uh, with our chaplaincy program that we, we plan to implement here. Um, the building was started uh, started construction back in February of uh, 2020. We expect to complete construction the first week of June um, of 2021. Uh, it's an $18 million uh, construction budget, about $145,000 uh, a unit. And we are utilizing the low-income housing tax credit program. Uh, for those of you that may be unfamiliar, there are two tax credit programs. There's a 4% program and a 9% program. Uh, the 9% program is generally very competitive. Uh, these programs are administered through local state agencies here in Georgia. The Georgia Department of Community Affairs administers the program. 9% um, program uh, uh, is can be challenging. You compete against a number of other developers and applications, and we did put this site forward to compete uh, under that program, and we were not successful. Fortunately, our uh, application wasn't selected. Uh, therefore, we went the 4% route. A uh, 4% tax credit program essentially pairs uh, housing bonds. Um, it's supposed to be non-competitive. So you can, as long as you can fill the financial gap of your project, this is a palatable way to go. Um, so we, I, I'll get to it a bit later, but we did arrange a, a, a rather large capital stack to be able to do this under the 4% program. Uh, very broadly speaking, the tax credit program is essentially pairs private capital with a public tax credit. Uh, so essentially the IRS will give uh, state finance agencies uh, housing tax credits and, those, and developers uh, such as national church residences will apply for those tax credits. If awarded, um, we go through an investor or in our industry we call a syndicator and we, uh, we, the syndicator then purchases our tax credits and takes investor dollars, gives us equity or capital that we then need and utilize to build the building. Um, a lot of institutional investors utilize the program. Uh, your JP Morgan, Chases of the World, those ent entities that have, uh, are highly profitable and they're looking for tax credits, we give them tax credit, they give us capital to build these affordable housing projects. Uh, we had a number of financial partners that brought this deal to life. Uh, some of them there are, are uh, indicated here. Obviously, Georgia Department of Community Affairs awarding us 4% credits in bonds. Um, we had uh, Invest Atlanta actually issue those bonds, uh, and they also provided us with uh, gap financing that made this deal happen. Uh, National Equity Fund was our investor syndicator, and uh, Bank of America was our construction lender. And we utilized our Bricadia mortgage capital to originate a permanent loan. Uh, and we used a, a Freddie tax exempt loan on this project. Very excited about it. Uh, we hope to, uh, again, open uh, first week of June and we'll start uh, our, our leasing efforts. And uh, we hope uh, to see some of you there. To that end, I'll hand it back to you. Let me, share oh, a, a, let me share a closing thought, especially to faith leaders that may be on board. Uh, the, the the real key is called the power of prayer. That's our weapon. That's our stronghold. 
Do not minimize it. We are a church where miracles really happen. Uh, and the power of persistency, we bought this land in 1999, is now coming into fruition 20 years later. Many of my colleagues drove by, laughed at me, asked when we were gonna build. Like Nehemiah, we just had to stay on the wall, be persistent, so the power of prayer persistent. But then lastly, the power of partnership, having the right relationship, having the right relationship with resources will yield you the right results. I wouldn't be a preacher if I didn't give you the last three points. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, and uh, excellent overview of the project. Thank you, Dennis. Um, there is a question before we move to the, the next presenter uh, for you, uh, Pastor Elegant. It says, uh, someone didn't catch the, I believe it was three E's that you, had men you mentioned when you gave your presentation, evangelize, educate, and- Yes, it's called, it's called evangelize the world, educate the saints, edify the body of Christ. But here's the last one, it's four, embrace the future. And this pandemic period has forced us to embrace the future. But a part of this building and this project is embracing the future. So that's four E's. Evangelize, educate, embrace, and edify. All right. And there was a question for uh, David Bowers, but we're going to say that one to, to we hear from our next presenter. So I want to go ahead and tee up Philip Soros, the president of the Beverly J. Soros Foundation to tell us about the legacy of Vine City. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And I would like to take a, just a moment to thank Tim, Megan, and everyone at Enterprise Community Partners for the opportunity to present uh, the legacy of Vine City. Um, uh, you know, Reverend, Reverend Darrell, that was a, I, I cannot stress enough how important your words are in truth uh, about prayer and persistence. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that here in, uh, with our, our Bishop Johnson, who, uh, who, uh, personified both of those traits very much in this development. Uh, so my name is Philip Searles. I'm the president of the Beverly J. Searles Foundation. We are also a nonprofit developer like NCR, but significantly smaller. Um, we currently own around 900 uh, affordable housing units here in Georgia. Um, our team members have been, and our, our principals have been in real estate now since the mid 1970s. And uh, in the late 90s, um, we also, heard the call um, about as we were developing uh, properties for Sunrise Senior Living that individuals who couldn't afford that three to sometimes $8,000 a month in rent really needed a good quality place to stay. And that was actually our introduction into affordable housing. Um, so I would like to start and talk about the, the legacy at Vine City here, which as you can see on your screen, um, this, this property is a uh, right near in the heart of downtown Atlanta, right near Mercedes-Benz Stadium. We, we love this photograph. We love uh, the fact that we are not only open right now, but we are also uh, 99 or 100 percent occupied. Um, the, the idea of partnerships, and I cannot stress this enough to, to, to the faith-based organizations on the call, is so vitally vital to these developments. Uh, we also utilize the 4% tax credit program. Um, and one of the things that we identified very early on in the process was that Vine City has been, has such a marginalized population that even the rents, the rent structure that we use for affordable housing would rent burden the existing population in Vine City. Uh, so one of the things that we were very able to, we were very lucky to do was to partner with the Atlanta Housing Authority into getting what is what they call a home flex agreement, but that is known as, um, as a, typically like a section eight project-based voucher. This preserves affordability for the residents um, this way that no resident pays more than 30% of their income towards their rent. Uh, <clears throat> the capital stack on this deal was a little different. Also um, these bond deals tend to have a need for additional soft financing. One of the layers of financing was with the city of Atlanta, we were able to get a uh, million dollars from the Vine City Trust Fund. Um, in return for that, we wanted to, they, you know, the city wanted to see a uh, longer affordability period. So one of the things that sets this development apart from other uh, developments, uh, affordable housing developments, is that we actually have a 65-year Lura affordability on the Lura. So no matter what happens for the next 65 years, this property will be affordable, um, which we'll get to later on of why that's so incredibly important. Uh, so a little bit about Vine City for those who are not from Atlanta. 
Vine City truly is the heart of Atlanta. As you can see on this map, it is right in the, you know, right next to downtown Atlanta. We, such a, the historic, the historical significance of Vine City. Uh, it's, civil rights was, this is one of the birthplaces of civil rights in this country. You can see the, the, the laundry list, uh, not, starting with Dr. King, uh, but there are so many people that are from Vine City that have played such an important role in this world that it truly is to an extent almost a disservice that our, our city has allowed Vine City to become uh, the condition that it, it, it was in. Um, and I say was because things are changing and the West Side is on the rise. And there have been phenomenal organizations out there, not just the, the large organizations like the West Side Future Fund, but um, there's actually a Chodo that I know is on this call, Leonard Adams is with Quest, and he's been doing incredible work in this West Side community for a very long time. So there's a lot of talented people that are really uh, invested in these communities, which makes um, being part of this development and part of this community such a wonderful opportunity for our team. And that's where I would like to kind of talk about how this development was initially concepted. Um, the church partner in this is definitely the heart and soul of this development. Uh, the foundation really didn't have, our eyes were never in Vine City. It was the church that sought us out and approached us and explained to us what their vision was. And they talked about how for the past 20 years, they've been crafting a vision about creating a safe, affordable housing for seniors in this community. And one of the things they also wanted to create was going to be um, uh, community service facilities on the property as well that could help a larger demographic in the population, not just our seniors. And so while we had these, they had these grand visions, we were able to provide the housing solution, but not the community service side. But that was part of the negotiation that we ended up having with the church about what we can do and what we can't do. Part of this was size constraints, other part of this was just financing constraints. But for the houses of worship at, you know, it, it, who were interested in getting in, involved in this, there's a lot that you can do before you even engage a developer that would kind of that would bring a little more leverage to your side of the table. And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit too, because um, Bishop Johnson and, and his predecessor, Bishop Hall, did so much in this community and did so much for this development that I think it does merit some conversation. So Whereas when we're developing communities, we do want community engagement. We want to know what the community is interested in finding out. But in this situation, <clears throat> Bishop Johnson and Bishop Hall spent 20 years working with the neighborhood, crafting a response of what the neighborhood sees is gonna be a vital need in that community. So when we came forward, when we were introduced to the church, they already had the community buy-in, which is very crucial in Atlanta, as well as you know, any major city that we're trying to develop and not just getting zoning, um, not just getting the, 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 the zoning approved, but also not having uh, public backlash for the communities that you're trying to do. The next thing that the church did long before we even joined in was they worked with the city of Atlanta to actually zone this site. So uh, the, the city had a process called the uh, special administrative permit, which years ago, the city decided that they were going to identify different parts of, the, parts of Atlanta that would have um, a community crafted plan. And that plan would then, their zoning laws would then be in conformity with those plans. Uh, our church partner actually took our site that we've developed on and got the spot zoning for this site to where our zoning was exclusive to the entire city of Atlanta and very advantageous for the density that we were achieving, we were trying to achieve on this housing development. And it wasn't until after a lot of the community buy-in and entitlement that the church worked on that was when, when we were introduced. So we were brought in in about 2013, 2014, and it took a few years to get together because there's a lot of um, moving parts that were going on in Vine City and in this development in general. But the timing couldn't have been better. Um, as we've seen across the country, there has been a revitalization, a renaissance in downtown metropolitan areas. Uh, one of the, you know, and while that, that, that could be good for the tax base, that the, there are a lot of legacy residents that generally get forgotten about or displaced from this gentrification efforts that we've seen. Currently in Vine City, we have 
amazing things going on. Not only do we have the brand new Mercedes-Benz Stadium, but Rodney Cook Senior Park is going to change the face of Vine City. We're already seeing increasing home values. We're already seeing that people are getting displaced from this historically significant African-American community. So to be able to work with houses of worship in these neighborhoods to provide this long-term affordable housing truly goes along the mission of while communities are gentrifying, we're not displacing our legacy residents, which is a crucial key that a lot of places have ended up missing out on. <clears throat> the, uh, the partnership side of things and I, is uh, very, the importance of this, I cannot uh, stress enough. The, as you can see here, the crafting the relationship takes time, patience and commitment from both groups. I would urge any, anyone from a uh, faith-based organization that's looking into this to truly understand what the relationship is going to be with your development partner. Uh, there are some great nonprofit developers and there are some great for-profit developers, but you truly need to have a sense of purpose, um, understand the sense of purpose of the developers you're partnering with. Uh, some people might be more interested in the bottom line. Some people are much more interested in doing a social impact. Um, to align your vision with the, with the developers is a crucial first key because then it's gonna come upon the developer to then align the vision of your church and your plan with the other equity and the other investors in the deal. Not only the, the, uh, the, the tax credit investors, but the state agencies, the lenders, um, the city municipalities and so forth. And that's something that is a lot easier when your mission is aligned with the development partner you have. Um, so I heard that, uh, that Dennis or had spoken a little bit about the lie tech side of the, of these issues. And that's, you know, so I can kind of skip over that for the most part and talk about what the church was looking for and how we aligned our, our missions together to create this. The church wanted to see a longer commitment of the affordability. And so we, again, we were able to work with the city that provided, and that, that much longer term than what the, the typical compliance period is. The church also wanted to provide a, an area that would provide some financial resources to this church to commit to enhancing the lives of the seniors we're serving here. So one of the things that we're working on is creating a social service contract that would help put money in the church's pocket each month in return for the church providing services. These services, um, are we, we consider to be not so much wraparound, but uh, vital components of breaking poverty. While housing is a great thing to help do that, it's only one component. And we look at things like food security, access to healthcare, public safety, education, um, access to jobs and park and rec parks and recreation as really other key fundamentals that are essential to creating a better life for people. And so the, our church partner in this, the Higher Ground Empowerment Center, really is doing a great job in providing food security and access to health care for our seniors uh, and also bringing in uh, you know, APD to do um, the, the, the monthly police updates of what's going on in the neighborhood. So we're able to provide a, a, a better quality of life. And that's what it really comes down to for the people that we're trying to serve here. Um, the foundation itself, one of the components in the negotiation with the church was that we, again, this church, this development being the heart and soul, uh, being the church being the heart and soul of this development, we didn't feel like this was our development, but this was the church's development. And so what we agreed to do was to sell our interest in the development to the church after our guarantees are done for $10. Um, this, along with the social service contract, the amount of developer fee sharing, and the amount we paid on the land, would actually, over the 15 years of the compliance period for this, this development, would bring more than $6 million to this church. We feel that that's something that is reflective of our mission and we want to empower those that are already working in the communities. Um, and kind of an overview of the capital stack here, just to talk about this, this entire development was is a, is a $20 million, $20,500,000 $20, $20, development. We see that we had, uh, again, the federal equity coming in, the state equity coming in, uh, the, the, the Department of Community Affairs was able to bring in a $3 million home loan, which is, again, a, a, a very soft financing. Um, the city of Atlanta, again, committed their $1 million. And our, we have our from our, our permanent lender, Community Development Trust, is bringing in the permanent mortgage of $6 million. Uh, 
to the development partners out there and to the to the to the uh, faith-based organizations. I also want to talk real quick and show you guys a quick video about the publicity. So, that Philip, we're, you... we're running a little bit tighter. Um, can okay. We, if it's okay with you, if if we can share the um, the uh, video when we share the information, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, I'm after this. I was going to talk a little about the foundation, but I after that, I mean, I very much can be done. I know that we're kind of behind on time, so yeah. And, and we have uh, some great questions. I want to try to get in a couple of questions before sure. we turn it over to the next presenter. Of course. Well, thank you very much for your time, then. No, oh, okay. All right. uh, I was going to give you another minute if you want to give the, the foundation commercial. So yeah, the, so the, the Beverly J. Searles Foundation, we um, not only do we partner with nonprofit organizations, we also partner with for-profit organizations. Uh, we partner with um, Dominion Partners. They're actually one of the nation's largest uh, affordable housing developers in the country, but they're a for-profit entity. Uh, we found that, again, our mission's aligned um, with creating value to the resident. Uh, we work with housing authorities, we work with other nonprofits, and I think that it, it, it bodes well when churches, you know, just keep your mind open about who you're partnering with. Um, just because somebody's a nonprofit versus a for-profit, I don't think should, um, should be the determining factor. I think it really should be the people that you're actually going to be working with for the next 15 years. Thank you, Tim. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, so I know we're running a little bit behind, but I just want to pull out two questions maybe real quick. Um, before we turn it over to Althea in the next presentation. The first one I think is related based on when these questions came in to Dennis and Pastor Elegant about um, their project. Does the church own their property as well or do they pay the bank as well? Do the church own what property? I, I believe, I, I think they mean the church itself, your, your property. Yeah, our property, we own our own church property and the property that we had a... Uh, monetized agreement in terms of national church residents will uh, we sold, which will enable us then to be on the same property, a new church so that yes, we were on. So that the ultimate vision was two edifices on the same property. Right, so similar question, who owns the senior center, the church or the bank, uh, who earns the monthly profit from the center? Our national church residents actually own it. It's, it's uh, it's uh, titled us in terms of name, uh, but yes. Okay. If I can also just add into that point, um, you know, one of the things that the churches are able to do is uh, everything is a negotiation um, while you're working with the developers. Like in our situation, while we're the 51% owner of the developments and the church partner is the 49% owner, the church actually gets 70% of free cash flow. Um, so it, it, it can vary deal by deal. And I think those are points that as you're working with a developer that you do want to discuss with. Awesome. I agree. Every, every deal is, is different. You can profit up front, you can profit at the end, or you can profit during the process. Well, thank you. Really appreciate you guys presenting, sharing that information on great projects. Wish you continue success with those projects. We're going to transition to our next presenter, which is Althea Broughton, um, who's going to give us some things that we should take into consideration from a legal perspective. So Althea. Thank you, Tim. Um, and thanks to Enterprise for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, I am truly excited about this. I've done a number of church transactions or church affordable housing transactions where I've either represented the church or I've represented the developer. And if you look at this slide right here, this is actually a picture of Big Bethel um, and it's just exterior, but um, I was actually, um, the um, Council for Benoit and the partnership on this deal. So I did wanna take two seconds to answer the question that someone raised earlier about the ownership. And because this was a tax credit deal, what you will usually have is you'll have a general partner, um, which consisted of Benoit and the church, Big Bethel. Um, and then you will have a limited partner. And those are the people really bringing the money, the equity. And so the, the actual project itself is owned 99% um, by the investor. Um, however, the control and the cash flow and the sort of economic benefits of the transaction primarily flow to Benoit and um, the church. So I just wanted to make sure people were aware of that. So with that, um, let me move on to the next slide. Um, you know, Reverend Bowers took a lot of points um, that um, I was going to mention, but I will 
I think it's important to um, reference them again. First of all, it is really critical that you have your own lawyer if you are a church in this transaction. And not just any lawyer, you should have um, a real estate experience lawyer because there's really no such thing as the quote deal lawyer. Um, you will as a church have interests that are different um, than the interest of your development partner. And even though it is a partnership and it can be a great partnership, there will be things that are probably more important to you as a church that you will wanna protect. And there will be things that the developer finds important and they will wanna protect. So again, make sure that you have your own representation. Additionally, um, it is important that you do due diligence on your development partner, understand exactly what types of projects they have worked on. You do not want to be sort of their first round at this. You want someone who's experienced not only in affordable housing, because it is a very specialized area in real estate, but you also want someone who's experienced in joint ventures. Um, also, make sure that um, you really trust your partner. This will be a long-term relationship. And it, you know, regardless of what all the documents say, and there will be a lot of documents, fundamentally at the core of all of those documents is the relationship that you have with all of the transaction participants. So you'll need to make sure that fundamentally you are aligned with them in terms of what your goals are, how they approach business, sort of, you know, you know, th their view of the world, you'll want to make sure that you are aligned on that. And finally, I just want to also say that it is important that you recognize that this will be a long term process. Um, uh, you've heard others mention that, you know, it's been, it's taken years to bring deals to fruition, you know, it, it's easily five years. Um, and you, the, you are subject to sort of market constraints, um, laws change, rules change, um, there's a lot of change. So be prepared to um, stay in the partnership for a long-term basis. Um, so, and if people tell you otherwise, you should probably make sure you understand why they think otherwise. So with that, starting with creating the framework. So usually what will happen is, you know, a church will have something, either some land or some money, and they'll have a mission to develop housing. Um, and then they'll want to partner with a developer. Um, who will actually help them bring that mission um, to being. And, you know, there will be sort of what I will describe a framework document that will set the stage for the rest of the relationship. Um, and you could have either an MDA, which is a master development agreement, which is really truly an agreement. Um, and, it, and it should lay out um, who the parties are, what the expectations are, how the economics will be split, um, anything that is really important to the party should be set forth in the MDA. The alternative is an MOU, and we see those from time to time. And MOUs tend to be a little bit softer, um, and they are probably more conceptual in general and um, looser in language, but they are often not binding. So it's really just sort of a um, document that you might have that sort of sets forth a shared understanding. But if you are really about to engage in a um, transaction um, with a developer, you should probably get something that's binding. Um, and usually it's a um, master development agreement. We also see from time to time a joint venture agreement. But the key thing is, is it binding? And does it say what you wanted to say about your role and your expectations of the other parties? So with that, um, moving on to the next bullet point, you should also understand what the parties are expecting of each other. So if you are a church, what are you expecting your development partner to do? Are you expecting them to do zoning? Are you expecting them to do community relationships? Are you expecting them to arrange all the financing? What are your expectations of that? And that should all be set out in your MDA or your MOU. Um, it's important that you make sure it's clear if there's something that the church is going to take the lead on. And often we might see, you know, community relationships or zoning or neighborhood meetings, because oftentimes the church is really the, the local representative in the community. So if the church is going to take the lead on that, you'll probably want to spell that out in your MOU or your MDA. Um, with respect to the financing, you might see the developer who usually has the expertise and the experience and often relationships in this area, take the lead on financing. And so, but what you should also be clear about in your MDA or your MOU 
is, you know, what decisions are important to the parties. And so when we're negotiating these documents, you will see sort of a, a you know, and it's not a bad thing, but there will be a tension around control and who has to approve everything. And so you'll see language where, you know, the developer might propose, you know, we'll consult with you about certain things, um, which means literally that they will consult with you and they'll get your opinion, but there's no obligation to, in fact, um, you know, take your opinion and do what you want. So there might be some items where you might actually want a consent right. Uh, and there are some items where you might want to have a consulting right. So for example, um, it might be really important for you to know, you know, to weigh in on the management of any property that's got your name or that's associated with you. So you might want to have a consent right over who the management company is or will be. Similarly, you might want to have a consent right on any sale of the property. Um, there might be some things though that you might not want a consent right, but you just might want consultation on like who the general contractor is or any design plans. And so that's all a part of working out what's in your MOU or MDA. Where do you want absolute consent rights versus where do you want to consult? The next part of the MDA um, would be what resources and benefits are you bringing? If you have land, will you be selling that land at fair market value? Will there be an appraisal? If you are a church and you've got funds, is there money that you can actually contribute to the deal? Um, and so you'll need to lay that out as well so people can understand the full sort of picture of what's going on. And then finally, most importantly, sort of what are the ex economic expectations? And so for many of these deals that people have talked about, there is usually some sharing in the amount of fees that are generated off of the deal, whether it's developer fee, um, there might be other cash flow based fees. And by that, when I say cash flow based fees, I mean, you know, these projects generate some sort of income and you might want to have a share in that. So you might want to understand what your expected share of cash flow will be in the deal. Um, also, you know, and we'll get to this a little bit later in the slide, what are your expectations around the exit? And so sometimes you'll have a situation where the church may think, you know, it, you know, at the end of this deal, we're just going to get everything back for free. That may or may not be the developer expectation. But when you're talking about this up front at the very beginning of your partnership, you should understand what you know, the parties want. Will you be buying it back at fair market value? Will they be gifting it over to you? What will that look at? Um, and oftentimes, even though you set these economic expectations in, these, in the deal and you sort of set your expectations around the structure in your upfront document, there will be other considerations, primarily tax, I have to say, but there will be other considerations where if an investor or a lender comes into the deal, they will have certain concerns and you may need to restructure your deal. So it may look different than what's in the MOU, but what's really important is that you always go back to the core things you've identified in the MOU. So it may not be exactly drafted the way it's in the MOU, but you do use some principles in the MOU, sort of your North Star in making sure the economics turn out the way people expected in them when they first entered into the deal. This next slide deals with, um, and many, many of you um, on this um, webinar may already be churches and you're familiar with, the, familiar with sort of your processes, but I really say this for developers who may be on. Um, first of all, it's important to understand the timing of this whole process. Again, this is going to be a long-term basis um, relationship, easily, easily two years, um, just because of the cycle of tax credits um, and entitlement work easily, um, or you may have an opportunity to buy land way before you develop. So just understand that this, you know, you know, oftentimes congregations may expect to see something happen, you know, fairly quickly, and that may or may not be the case. Um, and we'll talk about that in sort of communication structures. Next, also, it's important to understand what approvals are going to be needed at whatever level in the church hierarchy hierarchy to actually do the transaction. So if you're going to be selling the property, who, who has to approve that? 
Um, does it have to go before the congregation? Does it go before a conference? Does it go up to another level? So understanding all of that, if the church is going to be making a loan, for example, who has to approve that? So it's really important for all of the parties to understand what approvals are going to be needed by the church um, and any denomination to actually facilitate the transaction. And then finally, communication structures are important. I think one of the earlier slides referenced who's gonna be sort of the point of contact for the church, that is critical to know, but also it's important to have a sort of a communication protocol. Um, and that's something that you can write in your MOU as well. You can say, you know, look, we wanna have monthly meetings on while construction's going on, or we want you to come before our church conference and talk about the process. Um, but what is really critical is that there is open communication back and forth um, between the parties. So people are on the same page around the expectations and any issues that have been encountered so everybody can know, you know what the approach is or what the problem will be or everybody's on the same page because again, expectations will change throughout this process. And again, it's just important to harken back to the key principles that are in your MOU, your MDA as you're trying to structure the deal going forward. So to actually do these deals, um, we'll take, you know, hundreds of pages of paper, lots of paper, and that's probably what your lawyer's doing. Um, and so let's start our first with the church. Um, many times a, a church will have an organization, an entity, a 501c3, a, another affiliate corporation. It is really important that that organization be sort of in good shape from um, a corporate governance perspective meaning you've got a board of directors, you, you've got bylaws, you've, I mean, you're actually in good standing. Um, you know, that legal sort of entity is, you know, respected and um, it is, is in a position to actually engage in a transaction because, you know, while the church may have sort of a, a, an understanding about how things work, any investor or lender coming into the transaction will not have that understanding. And the first place they will go, they will want to look at your organizational documents and understand where does the authority lie? Have you sort of checked all the boxes? Have you crossed all, crossed all your T's, dotted all your I's in terms of the church organization? So that is really critical. If you're thinking about embarking on this process, make sure that you've got all of your sort of organizational documents together. Next, um, sometimes when churches have property, um, that you have to figure out a way to get um, the property into the vehicle that will actually own the project. And you can either do a sale um, if it's something the church wants to do. And I think it really just goes to what the church expectations are. If, you know, if the church wants to sell the property, they can do that um, and they can generate proceeds for themselves and pursue some sort of mission or some other activity that they want to do or build something else, um, as was mentioned in an earlier presentation. So selling the property is an option. Many times though, churches want to you know, control the land for a very long-term basis. So what will happen is the church might end up being a ground lessor for a very long-term ground lease, you know, upwards 75 years or plus. And what you will want to negotiate as a church is, you know, what happens, you know, during the term of that ground lease, you know, are there certain things you want to consent on? Again, that sort of control theme. Also, you'll also want to think about what happens when the um, end of the um, ground lease term um, comes to be or it expires, or it terminates. You get all the improvements back, you're back in a position of ownership. So these are all things that you think about in terms of getting the land into the partnership that's going to actually own. And let me just say it is um, for tax credit deals, it is going to be very likely that you're going to either need to convey that land either through a sale um, or some sort of ground lease. Next, um, a church will, you can be a co-developer. And we had talked about, you know, you know some, some possibility of a church earning fees. So you would actually, you know, line yourself up with the developer and identify what activities you would take on and you will earn a fee for those activities. So it's a way of the church um, participating in the economics of the transaction. Um, and then some churches also may use this as a mentoring moment and a way to get experience so that you may want to, you know, have the experienced developer help guide you through this process and help, you know, expose you to concepts 
and help you learn along the way so that, you know, you know, in years in the future, whether it's five years, 10 years, whatever, you all, uh, the, the church might have a um, development arm that they consider part of their mission and they do this really well. And that happens pretty frequently. The other thing that you should think about is um, your role as a co-owner. And so while we just talked about in a tax credit partnership, the investor will own most of the deal, but the cash flow will probably be going to, most of the cash flow will be going to the general partner. And your ownership is what will entitle you to get a share of that cash flow because at the, at the end of the day, after all the bills are paid, there will be a pot of cash and there will be somewhere in an agreement, something that says where that pot of cash goes. And you can participate in that cash flow and that can just be a stream of revenue for you depending on how well the, the property performs. Um, the next thing would be management. We talked about this earlier. Um, if it is um, housing, you will probably, um, as a church, want some say in the management company. You will want it to be managed well um, because it is part of your mission and it's part of your responsibility to the larger community. And then finally, um, what people should also think about, and I think this is probably something a lot of people don't think about, is you know, what happens, you know, at the end of the transaction, what do you want? So for tax credits, there will become a time at 15 years where there will need to be made a decision about, do you want to get the investor out? That's a conversation you should have with your development partner now. Do you want to get out? Like, do you want to, you know, give it all over to the developer or sell it to the developer? But you should be thinking about what it is you want or you should be thinking about how you can maintain as much flexibility as possible in your structuring. So with that, I saw Tim kind of pop up, which I think is the cue for me to stop talking, but um, these transactions are really exciting. Um, I love to work on them and they can bring about great benefits all for all that are involved. And before I go, just wanna note that these pictures are from Wheat Street, another um, church partnership where they did a really great rehabilitation and you can just see how the interior looks and um, for some of the amenities for those seniors. Thanks a lot. And thanks for letting me share with you guys this morning. Thanks Althea, great information. Appreciate you sharing your knowledge and your expertise being in the trenches. Um, I do wanna uh, take one question cause we are a little bit behind schedule but it says Althea, this is, this is from David Park. Althea, this is gold information how much should a church budget for this level of legal expertise on such a deal? Oh, great question. Um, so um, two things. Um, I, I think that for this type of, first of all, when you're negotiating with your development partner, you should see if there is some, you should see whether that development budget can actually cover the church's legal costs so that you're not coming out of pocket for that. And so that it's a sort of a cost of the project. And that's a question, a conversation that you could have. Um, for me um, or firms like mine, um, our fees are a function of time. And so if the deal is relatively straightforward and you're comfortable with your partner and their counsel, it, it really shouldn't be that much. And I'm probably going to say not that much, but it's, I'm going to say a number that probably shocks people. But I would imagine if you're comfortable and you know that it's an um, established, um, really good developer, your counsel probably is just really reviewing documents to make sure the things that you care about are in there. So that's probably like maybe $25,000, $30,000. And maybe you've got an opinion that you're giving as legal, legal counsel. Um, but it should not be that much. The more complex the con transaction is and the more issues there are, for example, there might be real estate issues, there might be lending issues, there might be organizational issues. In fact, you know, I've dealt with a transaction with a church where their organizational documents were not in good shape and we were running around trying to find board members, some of whom may or may not have passed away. And it just created a lot of time, which is cost. And that becomes much more expensive. But I would start at least with sort of the $30,000 range. Um, and it may go up depending on what the transaction calls for. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for the information. Uh, and with that, we will transition to the next panel. And uh, Megan Shannon Volkovic, our VP and market leader for the Southeast, is going to moderate the final panel, which is working as a team, the partner's point of view.
Megan? Great. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Althea. Uh, this has been a terrific session so far. I'm learning things myself as I'm jotting down a few notes. Um, so um, working together is our next panel, and working together involves mission and vision, building trust, planning and decision-making, and technical expertise, and we've heard a lot about that today. So today with us, we have three partners who have been working in partnership with faith-based development. Uh, we have Reverend Jeanette Dickens, in an, who is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, currently serving as the senior pastor of College Park, First United Methodist Church in College Park, Georgia. We also have with us Sherry Ong, co-founder and principal of Good Places, which, and she is a real estate developer and business consultant working to create innovative, sustainable, and equitable communities in Atlanta. And we also have Alan Patricio, principal of ABP Associates and president of the Housing Resource Center, which is a nonprofit corporation that provides technical assistance to other nonprofit organizations and public agencies in providing affordable housing. So with that, I'd like to kick us off asking each of you a question to respond to and welcome our other panelists to chime in. Uh, we will ha approximately have five minutes for each response, leaving time for Q&A. Um, I, will, I will just raise my hand, um, just letting you know that five minutes has been up uh, just so that you can wind down and we can get to the next question. Um, I'll start off with Sherry. Um, working together as a team means there is a process of building trust among the partners when you are trying to manage mission, vision, and business at the same time. Can you share how and in what ways you were able to build trust in the partnership process? And was best practices and peer project visits a part of this building trust process? Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sherry, and I just wanted to I'll keep it super quick since we only have five minutes. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, I moved from Australia and my family uh, started 25 years ago, one of the, what is now one of the largest um, second generation immigrant churches in Melbourne. Um, I have a master's and postgrad degree in theology um, and, in, and in finance, um, which leads me to the position where I am now. Um, I will say, in terms of answering your question, Megan, that uh, this is definitely a calling, um, given the amount of, uh, as you heard before, complicated, uh, long, long process that requires extremely difficult navigation of partnership, process, and, uh, and money. Um, this is definitely not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> like for those who are, um, you know, just at the beginning of this endeavor, um, I will say that it's going to require some, uh, you know, it's going to start and stop and maybe some failure. So, <laughs> so just to, to give that as a bit of a uh, premise, um, in, terms of, in terms of what I think is really important in terms of uh, developing partnerships, I think unity um, at the leadership level is super key. Um, so having a, a united leadership front at the church is I can't emphasize it is one of the most important things to make a project successful. Um, you can't have a, a, a leadership that is divided um, in terms of their vision, in terms of their approach to mission and business. Um, if, if they are divided, it's extremely, it's already an extremely hard process, just, you know, as you've heard, um, and complicated process. And if you don't have unity at, at that leadership level, um, it will inevitably break at some point. Um, it's a very complicated balance between mission and vision, um, uh, mission and business, because at, at the end of the day, everybody wants this to be mission focused, right? So this is why the church exists. This is why the, commu why the community impact is so important. Um, it's because we want the mission to be at the forefront. Um, at the same time, we can't compromise at the business level because if we want this to be done professionally and for the project to be successful, we have to not compromise on bringing in professionals like Althea, like um, uh, professional developers who need to essentially bring their level of expertise to the table. Um, if you try to skimp on, on, that, on that, then I, I think you know, you're just doing yourself a disservice because at the end of the day, you know, you can't achieve the mission without that, that level of professionalism. 
Um, and it's very hard, I will say, for a church to do that sometimes because I've been on the other end and I've, you know, my family operates the church. So, so I understand that everything is done on a dime. You know, everybody wants to do everything on a dime. Um, and they're very used to working with volunteers. So this, this is a different approach that at the end of the day requires a lot of navigation. Um, finally, I will say that um, in order to, to, you know, to build trust, I mean, this is, you know, how do you build trust is, is like, how do you, you know, how do you work in your marriage? <laughs> you know? Like it, there's so many factors that go into building trust apart from, you know, just, you know, patience, perseverance. Um, I think at, at the end of the day, a shared vision is, is super key. Um, you can't just look at a piece of land and say, hey, I wanna put affordable housing on there. Um, there has to be a shared vision. Um, and so being able to articulate that vision very clearly for both parties um, in terms of the developer and the church is extremely key. It, um, and so having that shared community outcomes where, where the developer and, and the pastor meet, um, being able to articulate that is extremely important. Um, so that's a lot of what goes on in the pre-development phase for us, and it can take years, exactly what um, uh, it said. Great, and then just uh, did you, as a part of the building trust process, uh, real quick, did you visit any other sites in helping to understand what the outcome can ultimately be in the partnership? Yes, um, so, well, we, we didn't, but the church did, and so, and this, and the project that we are currently working on is actually a demonstration project for that very reason. Um, so, I, it, do you want me to share a screen? I might share a quick screenshot of... Um, a quick of, screenshot would be good, and then I'm going to ask a, uh, Reverend Dickens a question. Okay, so this is a quick screenshot of the development team structure um, to give everybody an overview. Um, you can see it's a very complicated team structure. Um, there's many parties involved, and this doesn't even include the church and the city, all of which were parties to the agreement. Um, so we have uh, us as a for-profit entity that we're for-profit, but 100% mission. Um, and then we have uh, set up a CDC because the church did not have a nonprofit. Um, so they work with the arts organization that we are, is also a partner. Um, and finally, we have the low income tax credit group. Um, so in terms of the site, I will give you also a super quick, um, uh, a super quick uh, overview of the site. Um, and this will give you a little bit of context for Jeanette's uh, session coming up as well. And I will leave this up for Jeanette's um, session. So you can see that this is the, um, the site. Uh, part of it is owned by the city. Um, and they contributed the land as part of the deal. Um, the rest is owned by uh, the United Methodist Church um, and it's owned by the conference, which Jeanette will go into. Um, they are selling part of the land, which is gonna be to us, um, Good Places and CSMI, which is the development group. Um, and then the third part will be owned, um, which is owned by the UMC will be sold to Tapestry, which is the low income tax credit developer of which uh, we are also minority partners. So we basically um, play a master development role and have brought all the partners together, working with the city, the conference, and you know other developers uh, and the community partner at the same time. And in the, um, the LIHTC project with Tapestry, uh, does the church have right of first refusal at year 15? So at year 30, um, they do. It goes completely back to the church after year 30. 50, 50, 50 percent back very good right great so Jeanette I mean Reverend Dickens excuse oh, me oh no Megan <laughs> um, I you know being able to make decisions timely in each step of the development process is important uh, faith-based partners in many cases work very closely with their governance committees boards and congregations adding to the layers of reviews and approvals and I, that was referenced earlier as well can you speak to lessons learned in efficient decision-making processes when working in partnership? Yes, um, I, I come, as I had shared before, I've come, I came in with a lot of experience in real estate background um, in my former life and also have led large churches in the conference. And so 
I've dealt with building buildings for churches, selling property. In fact, I chaired one of the committees where I even helped sell churches before we contracted with another group for the conference. And so because I came in with that, I knew how to navigate with, you know, with all of the committees that are in the church. But this is, as Sherry said, it's a new, it's a new concept, a new pilot for the North Georgia Conference. Um, they're used to when churches are declining. I know Reverend Elegant uh, mentioned this as well with declining membership and all. They're used to just selling their property and then moving on and then they redevelop other churches. But this church has been in, in the community for 125 years and is a mainstay right off of Main Street. So working this project all the way through, not just the church committees, but then also through the North Georgia committees, there were a lot of people that I had had former dealings with and at least came in with the, I came in with the credibility that they knew that I had done that in other churches. And so I think timely decisions are critical. I know that we've had a lot of people speak about the long process of this, but I was actually brought in September 1st and we have already sold two pieces of the property and we have the federal application in for affordable housing. And this has occurred since September 1st. Now, Sherry was here, she got here, um, you know, some months before me, but that's when I was brought in with a conference and we started the process with the city. So because we had the same vision for, and I knew what I was being sent here for because in the Methodist church, you're sent to your churches. I was asked to come here specifically for the development. We started off, Sherry and I both did, part of it is, you know, just who she is and her company is, but the fact that she came from a church family in Australia and she has a degree in, in, from seminary, our hearts sort of got linked immediately. So the trust didn't really take mm -hmm. a lot for us to be able to build between the two of us. We're very much alike. We both have business backgrounds. And then we also have real estate backgrounds. And in addition, we, you know, what Reverend Elegan said, this is like for eternity. So I viewed this whole project in a way that for the church was critical as well, that this has not temporary effects. This is really building for the eternity. And I think Reverend Elegan said that we're, we're in the eternity business. And so this church working through those committees and reminding the committees as we work through them that this is what we are about as Christians and as a faith-based community, I think that's actually what propelled the project. We didn't get caught up in, you know, the buildings and the um, pieces that we're doing and the renovation and all that. We have to keep the vision in front of a church that it is really for the eternity. It is for the well-being of the entire community, not just the church. And partnering with the city is absolutely critical. And we never really shied away. I know you're told a lot of times that you need to keep those pieces separate with government entities and um, church, but in all city meetings, I never shied away from that. that's what we were moving towards, that everything we do here for providing housing to retail to push push theater is all about having building trust between us in order to be able to share and evangelize as, as Reverend Elegant said. And so, so uh, just to on that point on wrapping up so in in this situation what would it um, is it fair to say that once um, the church and committees uh, got comfortable with what was being proposed, you were given authorization to move forward on all the steps that were needed to proceed with the project? Yes, we were actually, I was actually given authority by the North Georgia Conference. Um, the church is just one entity because in the Methodist church properties held in trust by the conference. And so the church was probably the, um, you know, the lesser of working it through all the levels from our comptroller to attorneys to the conference trustees to get it to where it needed to be all the way up to the bishop and the North Georgia conference. So it took many, many layers to be able to get that. But each one that got, a, you know, that approved and got behind it, then it made 
the next one, uh, you know, a little easier, but they all had different questions, but we had the answers for those questions as we worked it through that conference level. Very good, thank you. Um, Alan, uh, private partners in working together with faith-based organizations can bring development and regulatory technical expertise to the partnership. What technical expertise have you been able to bring to a partnership and do you lay out the roles of each partner in a development agreement and, or an MOU as Althea was speaking to earlier? We weren't that organized. I've been doing this 37 years. So it was all, we're all feeling our way throughout this, but we built, we have 11 properties now, mostly senior, they are all mostly section 202 properties. So that means it's affordable senior housing. And then we have one property in Oakhurst that we did with Shepherd Center. It's 14 units of, for people with permanent spinal cord injury. So, but it all comes down to communications. And we were lucky over time to have a good HUD office. Um, the HUD is not such an active player right now. And it's a strange time. Uh, uh, we don't have a 202 program or an 811 program. They're supposed to be coming out this year. We don't know. Uh, but uh, keeping those uh, in line and keeping the line of communications between everybody open is what I specialize in doing. Many of these projects, and I've worked on with national church residents with almost everybody on the call, I've done something with. And that was just trying to openly communicate something and being honest with HUD. And we've had good support from HUD. So uh, it's been, uh, and the city of Atlanta, I, you know, it's a good place to do business. So. I just encourage people to be open with them and ask your questions. And, and just thinking about technical assistance. So, you know, as a, a private partner that comes in on a faith-based development uh, preservation or a new production, um, you mentioned the HUD 202, the 811. Can you speak about the importance of having a partner that understands regulatory obligations uh, as, it's, as it relates to those types of developments? Yes, and we have, fortunately, have a lot of sophisticated developers now and nonprofit partners that understand that. But, um, you know, it's a struggle, but, you know, keeping lines of communications open is what it's all about and making sure that we try to think of things ahead of time. And um, Yeah, and I know bringing, bringing the relationships with HUD and the public yeah. partners that you just mentioned is really critical and understanding the financing that's currently available. Uh, and restrictions on the preservation of some of these projects. Um, open, it's open and honest with the yeah. HUD offices. Uh, they're pretty good down there, uh, but they need, we always start out with a meeting and I've sat around that table and explain what we can and can't do. And they trust, it's trust. They trust us and they trust the developers. We have a good development community. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Sherry, a follow-up question for you. What would you say to churches who need to sell for revenue purposes, but want to maintain its legacy and the vision of the church for the redevelopment of the site? Um, I think that's a really great question. Um, there are a lot of churches that are finding it hard to survive, um, even pre-COVID, um, and I'm sure now even after COVID. Um, you know, sustainability is a huge question and it's understandable that some churches are gonna have to sell. Um, at the same time, I've moved from Australia where I saw literally churches get wiped out um, on every corner, um, being converted into uh, luxury townhomes, all sorts of different uh, uses and purposes. Um, and there was a real erosion of affordable and third, uh, third, third spaces, community spaces that um, that everybody could access affordably, um, leaving whole, you know, whole neighborhoods with prime properties um, essentially gone forever, right? When you sell it, it's gone. Um, and so I would encourage them to find a good way to transition um, to a, a community partner or a community developer that can bring in either tax credits, other, other forms of income, um, that can still ensure its community impact and legacy going forward. That's not gonna be the case with every property, but I do think for strategic properties like the ones um, in, like the one in College Park that's been there 125 years um, and is right on the MARTA, right in front of Main Street, um, there is kind of a stewardship and a, and a strong responsibility 
for, um, for these owners to really transition them well um, and with mission at the forefront. Um, and I'll just say just, you know, one last thing um, around money versus mission, because a lot of times, um, a lot of times churches justify the fact that they can sell a property, get the money and use the money for mission um, as a way to just sell the property, right? It's a quick fix um, to, to get the money and sell the property um, and still justify it by using the money for mission. Well, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, at the, you can do both, right? Like you can transition it and still maintain the mission. It's harder. It's going to take a lot more work and we'll take the right partners. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, God didn't say, go get rich and give money. He said, he said, be a witness, right? Be a witness and make disciples, which means that it's going to require for the church to be present. Um, and that that's a physical presence. And so I think if, if we can find ways for churches to do that, um, it's a total win-win and it will ensure long-term community impact. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up to that question, you know, I mentioned earlier about after 30 years, the church having the right uh, first refusal on the property. Can you talk about when that, got, that was negotiated and, and in which, you know, how that process unfolded? And one. I'm going to let Jeanette jump in here because I know it was it was definitely a partnership between me and Jeanette uh, working with uh, with our nonprofit developer. Um, and just because like, you know, they're a nonprofit also does not mean that everybody thinks the same way. And just because a church is, you know, um, you know, has certain goals. I'm going to let Jeanette actually kind of describe that. Uh, um, Megan, when we negotiated um, that and actually I had five things that I felt were really important for the conference and you know they they did not have language and we have a book of discipline that we're all governed by for what we did but it was it was actually the five things that I felt that were critically important for the church because I had done a financial analysis of the church within the first two weeks that I got here. And so earlier, one of the speakers talked about being able to share in the management um, and having some of the money that they get for having a management person on, for, on, you know, on staff. And I thought that was critical. Um, for the church because the church has got to get from here to there to be able to get all the development done. So that was one of the things that I felt was critically important. And I went through a list of the first four, which I thought we could get, but then for the conference, I thought if we could get back at the end of the tax credits for the conference, not the the church itself, because we never know what will happen and this could end up being a mission outpost. If we, if I could negotiate with the developer to get 50% of the sell when we sold the property at the end of 30 years. In Atlanta, that could be as much as $10 million. I mean, I just sort of calculated because again, I have real estate background and you watch, you look at the statistics in Atlanta and know what they go uh, for. It was a deal our developer had never done. His board asked him why he, you know, why he would even consider doing that. But again, I think that we have to think about exactly, Sherry and I have talked about this many times. We have to think about down the road. And I think we're very short-sighted in churches a lot of times because we are at the end of the road. We say churches have a life expectancy and then you can move and you can build in a more um, dense area where there is housing. But when you are in a strategic location, I even look at what we've done in the Methodist denomination. We've sold off strategic properties and communities that desperately needed affordable housing. And we send a very loud message to that community that the money is more important than being a part of that community and continuing to partner. So by setting up um, you know, and doing the negotiating because really Sherry and the other partners stayed out of my negotiation with affordable. I did mine with Sherry's and then I did this, but then I had to take that to the conference and convince them that that was a good thing because you know, what that looks like sometimes is that you have an encumbrance on the property that someone's mm -hmm. got to keep up with. 
So I remember one of the sessions I had to actually ask the question, I can leave this money because I got a lot of pushback because they didn't understand it because it is a complicated process. And those five things that I had built in to that letter of intent and had gotten agreed on, there were several they didn't really understand how that would work. And I said, we can either leave this money on the table, you know, and walk away and we're selling the property and we can get X or we can get 10 times that at the end of the tax credits. And if we're in mission and ministry, don't we want to get 10 times and reinvest that in the ministry of people? So once it was presented in that way and you quit, you, you remove the encumbrances, which, you know, Althea talked a lot about, you remove some of that and you get back to what the mission of the church is. That's when you can make those very complicated decisions. Well, thank so, you. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. So I appreciate you walking us through that. That's exactly what I was hoping to hear on the process. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sherry and, and Reverend Dickens and, and Alan Patricio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Tim, I'm going to turn it back over to you to wrap us up. Absolutely. So, yeah, so we have four minutes. Um, I apologize that we didn't get to everyone's questions. There's a few questions still left in the queue. But again, we'll make sure that we get those addressed from the panelists and send it out when we um, send the other information. So um, with that said, um, I just want to make a, a couple of closing remarks. Let me share my screen right quick. So a huge thank you for joining us for our first faith-based development initiative webinar um, in the Feeding Faith Leaders with Community Fervor series. Uh, I would like to also thank City National Bank for their funding support of these faith-based development um, initiative efforts. I also want to um, remind everyone that there are additional opportunities to engage in our faith-based development initiative virtual, virtual webinars through the end of the year, including uh, next month, the faith-based development annual summit that the Mid-Atlantic office that David Bowers represents uh, will be um, hosting. It's entitled a national movement of expanding impact in a time of expanding need. So there will be a, a national focus and not just a mid-Atlantic focus. That will take place on November 18th and November 19th from 12 to two o'clock PM each day. Um, you should have information to register for those uh, events, but we'll make sure that you have them again. Um, and then in December, we're also having the Iron Sharpens Iron Gathering. Um, it's going to be a faith-based development TA peer exchange. It's invite only, um, but if you are um, a house of worship or a partner that's working with a house of worship that has a project that is close to coming to fruition and you need some additional um, thought uh, partnership, some TA, um, please reach out to me. My information is on the slide and um, we'll see about getting you an invite to that particular webinar. Be on the lookout for a email um, from us that will have the webinar recording. We'll also have the presentation slides um, and the speakers bios. And we'll also include a brief survey that we ask that you please complete that will help inform us um, tweaking these webinars to make them more informal, more informational and more impactful for the um, people involved. If you would like to discuss our faith-based development initiative in more detail, please um, contact me at the information provided in the slide. Again, thanks and have a blessed day, everyone.